little bit more interesting thing. And um, so what it is, it's the seven metals of antiquity that forged the modern world. And um, looking it up online, there's um, many historians uh, refer to these. And so this is not just seven metals that I chose. This is kind of like what historians um, consider to be the seven fundamental metals. Um, just a little primer, um, you know, that uh, a couple thousand years ago is when humans first identified and found useful seven different metals. Originally, they were simply status symbols and ornaments, but soon they learned how to fashion tools and weapons by working them in a cold state, which means they didn't heat them. But then they learned to kind of heat them a bit to make them a little easier to work, which eventually led to smelting. And then they learned about combining metals to form better substances, what we call alloys. And tonight I'll talk a bit about how all of this occurred among the story of these seven metals. Um, so that these metals, the knowledge took humans from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age and then the Iron Age. Um, metals were stronger in stone and could be made in more specialized tools. Uh, stone was really limiting. Um, with using metals for like early types of plows, it allowed the dawn of agriculture to greatly expand. And by about 3000 years ago, these metals were the basis of human society. And as continual improvements over the centuries, they carried us into the modern world. And while they've been joined by other metals, they still find uses in our modern world. And they are also, they said, the metals upon which our civilization is based. Uh, the statue to the right here, if you don't know, um, is of the Roman Vulcan, uh, Roman god Vulcan. Um, Hephaestus is the Greek equivalent, and the Germanic or Norse god was Thor. Uh, this is a statue that stands in Birmingham, Alabama. It's 56 feet tall and stands on a 126 foot tall pedestal. Uh, it's considered the largest cast iron statue in the world, and it was made uh, for the World's Fair and such. And I have a little quiz for you here, and uh, Jerry, I think Brittany's going to help watch the chat on. I can't see the chat right now, um, so they're going to watch the chat for the answers uh, on these. And these are just uh, seven questions about it to see, uh, to have a little bit of fun with it. So please put your answers in the chat. So here's the seven questions for seven metals. Prehistoric humans identified and found useful seven native metals in antiquity. Which one on this list is not one of those metals? Keep trying, everyone. There we go. I think Curtis met bronze. Okay, ready for the answer? Well, the answer is, the answer is bronze. Yes, that is correct. Bronze is not a metal, it's an alloy. A lot of people think, well, isn't there, didn't I just say bronze age? Yeah. So we'll talk more about what alloys are in a moment. Yeah, so bronze is not one of, but the other seven on that list are the seven metals of antiquity. And I said, we'll be talking more about those as the program uh, goes on. Number two, most people per day today perceive steel as a modern, as a metal alloy of the modern world. Is it a modern metal or an ancient one? We have one ancient guess and three moderns. Four to two for modern. Hey, Paul, looks like right, we have ready? four to three for modern. Okay, here's the answer. It's an ancient metal. 
Most people perceived steel as a modern metal because in the mid 19th century, new processes starting with the Bessemer process and then others led to the modern steel industry where steel could be made cheaply and in large quantities. However, steel goes back over um, 3000 years. So steel, humans learn how to turn iron into steel very early. And again, we'll talk more about that. And it actually in the Western world, by the way, predates cast iron by over a thousand, a couple thousand years. So it's a very ancient. Okay, question three. What was the first metal to be smelted? A lead gas, two coppers, a silver. A gold, two golds, another lead, another copper. Looks like we've narrowed it down to gold, lead, and copper. Okay, well, here's the answer. Or silver. It is copper. That was the first metal to be smelted. Um, native copper that was malleable in a cold state, but too much working made it brittle. So they first learned to anneal it by heating it before hammering, which reduced to brittleness, and then eventually led to copper smelting. Next question four. Prehistoric humans recognized that one form of an ancient metal had a celestial origin. What was that metal? Couple irons and a mercury, a gold, silver, mercury. Iron from meteorites. Another iron. We might be trending towards iron. All right, Paul, I'm dying to know. <laughs> all righty. Well, technically, you could say all of these have a celestial origin because they're made in supernova. The actual answer is iron, uh, specifically meteoric iron, iron from meteorites. Yes. Um, it's a, what humans use was the iron nickel alloy of it. There's two basic types, uh, but uh, ancient humans use that. Um, the Egyptians called it black copper from heaven. And the Sumerians refer to it with their symbols for heaven and fire. Question five, normal campfires lack sufficient heat to smelt metals, necessitating the discovery of a higher energy fuel source. What was that fuel? Two coals and a charcoal. There's a peat, another peat, charcoal, charcoal. Looks like the most popular answers are coal and charcoal, with charcoal with a slight lead. Okay, you ready? The answer is charcoal. Um, charcoal is actually produced in a normal campfire, and by concentrating the burning coals of it, um, early humans realized that it uh, would produce a sufficient heat to smelt some of the early metals. And by the way, charcoal was the basis of metal smelting until about a couple hundred years ago, uh, when Abraham Darby first used coke to smelt iron over in England. That was the first time that a metal had been smelted using a high energy fuel other than charcoal. So charcoal is the historic one. Uh, it's a natural, by the way, it's a natural byproduct combusting um, carbon-based materials, mostly wood. Um, 
And if with an air blast with it, this is how I talk agreement with furnace, with the air blast, you can reach temperatures to smell even iron. And iron needs just under 3,000 degrees. It needs about 2,800 degrees to smell it. And uh, so with an air blast, charcoal can reach about 3,000 degrees. But historians believe that humans learned about the usefulness of heat processing of metals from another product that is also heat processed. What was that product? Seems like pottery is pretty popular and these answers are coming up quick. Yeah. Right. So yes, it's, it is pottery. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Questions, okay, excuse me here a second. Um, pottery making predates and an annealing and smelting. Um, humans are that baking clays at high temperature made them harder and more durable. And both of them taught about restructuring the burning coals of a campfire and later charcoal fires to produce a superior heat. So part of this is they think this is where they learned about heat um, for smelting and such. Final one. Most historians traditionally agree that cold working of native copper first occurred in the Middle East about 8,900 years ago. However, recent research is suggesting it might have actually happened elsewhere first, around 9,500 years ago. Where was that location? North, Northern Europe. <laughs> okay, we had a China and Africa and two North Americas. South America. You disabled my video. Northern Europe. All righty, this is going to be a surprise, Paul. Yes, here we go. North America. Uh, there is what's known as the old copper culture in the Great Lakes region and such. And I'll talk more about it in a moment. But uh, now evidence is suggesting that they may have been the first to actually cold work copper. So, okay, that's good. Uh, I had a little bit of fun with that. Um, so let's move on here. Um, some definitions for you while we talk about this. Um, first off, what is a metal? And it's today it's defined as it shows a shiny or lustrous appearance when freshly prepared, polished or fractured, that it conducts electricity, conducts heat, it's malleable and or ductile, we'll define those in a moment, can be a chemical element, an alloy or molecular compound. In astrophysics, it's all elements in a star heavier than helium. And today out of the 118 elements on the periodic chart, 90 of them are classed as metals. So we're a long way today from the seven of antiquity. Uh, a native metal, when we talk about that, is a metal that is found pure in its metallic state in nature. Uh, base metal would be a common and expensive metal compared to precious metals. And an ore is a rock that contains sufficient quantity of a metal that can be profitably extracted. Alloys are substances having metallic properties, generally composed of two or more elements, at least one of which is a metal. They don't all have to be metals, but at least one of them has to be. Uh, some alloys can be naturally occurring or they can be human made. Uh, most pure metals are too soft, brittle, or reactive for practical use, but by adding other metals, metals or minerals, it increases the desirable qualities, such as making them harder and less brittle, more resistant to corrosion, and have a more desirable luster or color, which is why humans very early learned about alloys. Uh, these are some common alloys. Uh, iron includes meteoric iron, cast iron, steel, stainless, tool, alloy, and such. Copper is bronze, brass, cupra, nickel. Tin includes pewter. Mercury includes amalgams. Lead is metallic antimony. Gold is electrum, and silver is sterling. Now, out of those, that list, um, 
I will not be talking about sterling because that's a more modern alloy, but uh, it does alloy with some of the other metals there, but uh, there are no historic metals where silver was the primary metal. Uh, metalworking is the activity of making objects out of metal and metallurgy is the branch of science and technology concerned with the properties of metals and their production and purification. Cold versus hot working. Uh, cold work is at a metal that's uh, where the metal is shaped at or near room temperatures without removing material. This can include squeezing, rolling, bending, and shearing. Hot working is a process which metals are plastically deformed at high temperatures, allowing the material to recrystallize during that deformation, keeping the yield strength and hardness low and the ductility high. Example of this would be casting, rolling, forging, or hammering, extrusion, and drawing. Ductile means it's a tensile strength. It means the ability to be deformed or drawn out without losing toughness. Malleable is a compressive strength, the ability to be hammered or pressed permanently out of shape without breaking. Uh, metal can be both or it can be either. Um, the cementation process, um, this is uh, in steel making. This was the historic technology that was used to make steel until the modern era. Um, it's an obsolete technology now, but it, basically they pack wrought iron bars in a heating furnace with charcoal powder surrounding it. The iron would absorb the charcoal, creating what was known as blister steel. And it was called that because as this would happen, gases would form in the metal, creating blisters on the surface of the iron. So they called it blister steel. It then had to be further uh, forged in order to uh, uh, kind of homogenize the metal. Um, Brass, an example, is another one that was made by a similar process like vaporizing in contact with zinc, uh, with copper ore and such. So that, uh, when we talk about cementation, this is what we're talking about. Uh, annealing is the partial heating and slow cooling of a metal to increase its workability. You don't heat it up to fully forced temperatures, but heat it up enough that it softens it a bit. Forging is to where you make or shape it with a hammer and press, you heat it in the fire to a point just below its melting temperature. Uh, like for instance, iron, you want it at least orange to yellow hot or even white hot, which is what it gets to before it actually reaches its melting temperature. And then smelting is the extraction of a metal from its ore by a process involving heating and melting and employing a chemical reaction to reduce the ore to raw metal. So it's more than just simply melting the metal you have to have a chemical reaction that takes place in the furnace. Like I talk about at a Greenwood, how iron is reduced in the furnace environment. So how did humans first discover metals? Um, well, uh, what I've been able to, to find on this is, um, again, we were introduced to seven metals that were known to, the discovery of it is actually lost. Nobody knows exactly how humans discovered this. Uh, because it occurs well before the first true writing systems in what we call before the historic period. Uh, although some writing systems did exist like cuneiform and hieroglyphs, nothing in it is recorded about the first use of any of the metals. Um, so as I said, no recording, no pictograms or anything like that, uh, anything that was written to talk about this. Everything that is known about the history of metals in this period is from the archeological record and has to be pieced together from that. But historians say that so pervasive was the discovery of these that the historians used it in the 19th century to divide ancient history into the ages. That's his stone, bronze, and iron. And without metals, we would not have our modern world if it had not been for this discovery. Um, think about that. We would still be in the Stone Age if it weren't for the use of metals. Well, something to note is that important discoveries like this don't usually happen only at one place or at one time. Uh, the archaeological record shows that many discoveries happened independently at different places, uh, at different times, and took different paths. Uh, for instance, mostly over in, in Europe and the Middle East, we divided it into three stages of history, stone, bronze, and iron. Recently, because copper has been found to be even important before the discovery of bronze, the fourth age has now been added to that called the Copper Age or the Chalcolithic. And Chalcolithic literally means copper stone. 
Um, so it's kind of a transition period between true stone bronze and the Bronze Ages. However, for instance, here in North America, it went from the Stone Age to the Copper Age and back to the Stone Age again. And historians are still debating about why that exactly happened, that it didn't advance into uh, more use of metals and alloys. So we're going to, because I could spend the next two or three days talking about all these emergences, I'm just going to focus on the earliest emergence of each of the seven metals. So we've got to go back to the Stone Age. And that's when millennia paleo humans fashioned simple tools from bone, wood, rocks, and minerals. Um, stone was the most common medium for these. Flint was especially useful for cutting edges, for instance. Um, the oldest known tool, stone tools date to around 3.3 million years ago. And this is about a half a million years before the emergence of the Homo species of which we're a part of. Toolkits were limited to such things as hammer stones, cutting blades, axes, spear points, and needles. And lifestyle advanced very little during this period. It took a long time for humans to advance very far in the Stone Age. Uh, however, there is some use of metals during this period. Uh, however, they were not used as metals. Uh, for instance, red ochre is derived from hematite, you know, an ore of iron. It's the most common ore of iron. However, they use it for paintings, cave art, pottery, tattoos, medicines, preservatives, and other things. And the use of red ochre goes back at least 300,000 years. However, humans did not identify hematite or even iron as a metal to around five to 6,000 years ago. And similarly, as red ochre comes from hematite, yellow ochre sometimes comes from ugarthites. Uh, another one of that period would be malachite, copper carbonate, which is a, a very nice green color. Uh, some of the early pigments derive from metals. So how were we drawn? Well, the first metal that we think that uh, humans were actually drawn to was gold. Um, and this appears to be about 42,000 years ago. Uh, they found some um, gold flakes and nuggets in caves where they had definite human presence. So they were in association with human uh, artifacts. So they think that humans were drawn to it probably by its bright, shiny yellow color. Um, they think it was most likely found in stream beds because that's usually the traditional place where gold is found uh, before modern mining. Um, and many historians think that it might have been children who were actually first drawn to it and may have collected it playing in streams. Um, the paleo humans noticed it stayed bright and shiny and didn't degrade like other rocks. So they started noticing things about it. They likely thought it was a gift from their gods. So they used it for status symbols and as wealth, like people would collect it to show wealth and uh, as status in their societies. However, even though they recognized it kind of as a metal, it was pretty much useless and unchanging for anything else. Uh, there's no evidence that humans work gold for about 35,000 years. Um, there's no uh, gold artifacts other than nugget-like things that's like in the picture there. Um, why is that? Well, gold is too soft for practical use for tools or weapons. It can't hold a cutting edge. However, it is useful for containers or as ornaments only. But it was thought that it was very hard to work with simple stone tools. However, during this period, it, it would start to teach humans things about the fundamental principles of metallurgy, how to find and recognize metals in nature, how to concentrate maybe by hammering pieces to form larger ones. They think they could have done that and shaping, working it into a desired form. So there may have been some crude shaping going on, but no actual true artifacts like we think of in that sense. And the pottery connection. Um, humans developed pottery around 31,000 years ago. It's one of the oldest human inventions. Um, and the oldest pottery artifact dates to that time period. There's a picture of it to the right. It's a pottery statue. Um, so you think about making pottery, it does required a suitable clay. Uh, the clay must be able to heat it and to turn it into ceramic. It must involve skills and time to prepare, shape, and fire it. 
And so it's a sufficient need to invest in pottery making to make it worthwhile to make it. Um, they also recognize that firing permanently changed the structure of the clay. And through time, the humans realized the techniques of heat processing to achieve different and desirable qualities of pottery. So they would eventually think, transfer this knowledge to the working of metals to make them useful. So finally, when we discovered metals for being a metal, it was somewhere around the end of the last ice age, around 10 to 11,000 years ago. Um, it came so rapidly on many fronts that historians call this period the Neolithic Revolution. It's where we started to evolve from hunter-gatherers to a sedentary lifestyle and settlements with the vision of labor coming. Um, during this time, the discovery of the usefulness of metals uh, happens. And we're using metal for early planting tools and allowed agriculture to greatly expand. Agriculture had been around, but it was slow until the introduction of metals into it. So how did this occur? Well, we think that early humans realized that certain heavy rocks deformed under hammering or working rather than flaking. The rocks surrounding campfires may have also led to the discovery that some rocks would melt when sufficiently heated. Uh, natural human curiosity would lead these people to try to figure out why some rocks did this. The result is the identification of metals. And that these metals and other traits would make them more useful than the bone or stone that we're, they were using up to that point. Um, they think that uh, humans also got the idea of smelting from pottery, uh, likely through mineral pigments. Example here is malachite. I have a sample of malachite rock and the malachite pigment. Uh, malachite was used as a green pigment in pottery. And long after copper was called worked or annealed, humans may have discovered smelting through this pottery firing process. And where the, uh, in the heated kilns, the copper would actually melt out of the malachite. And that happens at around uh, 1984 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just above typical pottery or in the range of pottery kiln temperatures, which could be just below that to just above that. So if the kiln got hot enough, the copper would actually melt out of this. And they think that they would find this red shiny substance in the kilns and wonder what it is and start playing with it and figure, figure it out. And they think that's how, that's how humans learn about smelting. And pretty soon they would start just heating a malachite on its own to see if they could extract this uh, new type of substance from it. Uh, I originally put together another timeline. I know this slide is busy, but I'll go over it quickly. You can always go back and review it uh, later on. I tried to put it all together for you in a single chart. The, in the center of it is the time continuum. At the left, it starts about 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And I take it up to just under 3,000 years ago, the beginning of the modern period or the historical period. All of the things listed above are considered historical events, uh, like the Younger Dry's cooling event uh, is when out of the ice age, things get colder again. Here's the Neolithic Revolution, the rise of ag agriculture in the Middle East, the Levant. Uh, Jericho is founded here. I put that. It's one. It's considered to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. You have the domestication of cattle, the rise of agriculture in the Americas. Pottery, though, developed 31,000 years ago. The potter's wheel wasn't developed until around just around 6,000 years ago. Then you have the domestication of the horse, wheeled vehicles. Uh, if you know of ice, ice, the ice man, let's see, this is where he lived, right here. Uh, cuneiform writing comes in, then Stonehenge, the Giza pyramids, the Trojan War, and the Iron Age ending and the modern period begins. So I kind of put those as markers for you. And then below you can see with the old copper culture. And what I did was I color coded the metals for you. The bottom left is the key for them. So when you see them, they kind of make a little sense out of, out of those. So I kind of color coded a little bit so you can see how the advancements in metals happen. As I said, you can always go back to the slide later on if you want to um, study it some more. Uh, and the errors are approximately located. It's kind of hard with this, with it jumping around to, to kind of put them precisely, but they're kind of at the rough place where they would be on this continuum. So let's look a little bit about the metals. Um, since humankind took off 
when the usefulness of metals was discovered. Uh, the seven again, uh, just to remind you, is gold, silver, copper, iron, tin, lead, and mercury. Five of these are actually found in their native state, which means they are found as a workable metal all by themselves. In the case of iron, it would be only meteoric iron. Only mercury and tin are not found generally in a native state. Most of these are not abundant in the Earth's crust. However, they became known to peoples all over the world and at different times. And these are the seven metals that civilization is based. The melting temperatures, I put them in order of melting for you. There's also this diagram at the right that kind of illustrates it also. I found this on the internet, uh, but it only gives it in Celsius degrees. So I give you the conversion here Fahrenheit to Celsius. Of course, mercury is liquid at room temperatures. Iron was the highest melting metal uh, in antiquity. Uh, below, I put some other metals for comparison. The first three are alloys that were used in the ancient world. The other three are more modern metals. Uh, as far as the rarity go, iron is the fourth most common element in the Earth's crust. Uh, it's actually the most common element in the Earth, if you consider the core of the Earth, but in the crust, it's the fourth most common. Um, and the next one clear down here is copper, and you can see uh, it goes down from there as to far as the rarity. So let's talk a little bit about some of the metals. Copper, of course, was the first one to be worked. So it becomes the first utility. Amount. Remember, I said that gold was the first one to actually be identified, but they really didn't use it as a metal at that time. So copper becomes the first utility metal. It's soft, malleable, and ductile. However, there was no smelting at this early time. And, uh, but uh, the natural human curiosity would drive people to want to study it and learn more about it. And the picture is currently the oldest copper artifact that is in existence. It's from the Middle East. It's about 8,700 years old. And this puts it still well within the Stone Age. However, remember I said in one of the quiz questions, there is a recent research that is changing this view. This is uh, in the Great Lakes, where they are now finding that ancient North American indigenous peoples mined, worked, and utilized copper for tools and weapons. Um, this appears to be an independent discovery and not a translocation of technology. Like, for instance, it did not come across the Bering Land Bridge during the last ice age. This appears to be a fully independent discovery. Uh, it's centered in the Upper Great Lakes region, you, most of it in Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, using core sampling and other things, they actually are finding evidence of copper working at 9,500 years ago. Although they don't have any actual artifacts from that, they do find other evidence within the uh, geologic record that takes it back to that. So it actually makes it slight old, slightly older than that uh, copper artifact I just showed you. In America, we don't go to stone, bronze, and iron. We have the archaic period uh, that we call it in the Stone Age. So these were Stone Age peoples, but we call it archaic in the Americans. Uh, for some reason, about 3,000 years ago, the people mostly stopped using it and reverted back to stone tools. And historians are not quite sure why, and the only thing they can say is, well, the copper never got alloyed, so it didn't become harder and more durable than stone. So they think eventually they just abandoned it. Uh, and also, I'll throw this in, there's no evidence of pre-Columbian contact with Vikings, Phoenicians, Egyptians, Western Europeans, Minoans, or ancient aliens. Uh, I know some of that floats around there on the internet about this, thinking that, oh, this, this is evidence that uh, old world peoples were over here 10,000, you know, 9,000 years ago. I said, no. This is an independent discovery uh, of indigenous peoples. These are some examples of copper culture artifacts that have been found. Um, the copper, by the way, out in the Great Lakes is about 95 to 99% pure. Um, so far, over 20,000 artifacts have been cataloged being found in the area of the old copper culture. Um, so they do have confirmed evidence of cold working. All of these are cold work artifacts. Um, towards the end of it, they do confirm some annealing did take place, although that's rather late in it. Um, 
before they reverted back to stone about 3,000 years ago. Uh, there is also disputed evidence that they actually did some melting and smelting of copper. Uh, there's some evidence of this with the Hopewell Mississippi cultures. Uh, this is not universally accepted. And it is in a period where potentially there could have been some old world contact that could be uh, into these things because the dating is not very precise. So right now they're saying the, uh, the most the most mainstream of it is that they did not do it, but there are some who believe they did. Uh, and of course, in North America, they never developed any of the copper alloys. So um, because of the copper working um, around the world, the historians have added this fourth age, the copper chalcolithic. Um, it's a transitional period from the Neolithic Stone Age to the Bronze Age. And as I said, it means copper stone. And um, it was added because recent archaeological discoveries now show significant use of native copper long before the first bronzes. It isn't a short time, it's now a long time. So they added this into it to account for the use of copper for quite a period of time. Um, so, and actually, the Copper Age doesn't start to around 7,000 years ago. So remember that copper artifact was 8,700 years. So it was around for a while before the Copper Age actually start. And they define that when they humans started smelting copper. But its softness and propensity to crumble uh, limited its usefulness in those early days. So there was only a few things that they used it for. But something better was needed. And this is where bronzes came in and why the bronze was considered to be an important age of human development. Um, this is the Bronze Age is defined as the uh, period where the hardest metal and widespread use was bronze. Uh, in um, most of the, uh, the uh, oldest part of the world, it's around 5,000 to 3,200 years ago. However, that does vary around the world with different sites. Um, it's the first metal alloy harder than its constituent metals, either copper or tin, which is modern bronze. Um, Humans first discovered bronze as copper arsenic, um, which is also a bronze, and possibly some copper and tin does occur in a couple places, but for the most part, it is not a native uh, alloy, but copper arsenic was the first one identified. And um, so eventually, humans learned to deliberately alloy copper and tin, finding it more useful than copper arsenic, and there were some other reasons too, because humans discovered very early that copper arsenic to, to work it was tended to be toxic. So uh, copper tin is not toxic in the same way. Uh, it's not really toxic to work it. So eventually copper arsenic was abandoned in favor of copper tin alloys. Um, brass is also developed during this time. Um, it's uh, copper and zinc. However, it's harder to make and therefore more rare and doesn't deserve its own age. Um, that's why we don't have a brass age. Uh, however, uh, in studying ancient brass and bronze artifacts, it's often hard to distinguish them. So today, historians and museums prefer the term a copper alloy instead of bronze or brass because there's over 400 identified different compositions of bronzes and brasses in the archeological record. Um, so they tend to prefer copper alloy now. Sorry, I don't know what happened here. Oh, there we go. Um, so these, uh, these knives, these are modern knives, uh, reproduction knives, but it kind of gives you an idea. The one on the left is a arsenic bronze. The other two are tin bronzes with different levels of copper and tin composition. Because the one in the middle is a little more brassy colored, the one on the right is a little more coppery colored. Um, so the first bronzes are natural alloys, likely to red people to realize the value in mixing these to produce more useful materials. Uh, tin bronze possibly could be discovered as a natural alloy, although again, I said it's extremely rare to find those two. However, it is known as the first deliberate alloy because surviving bronze, tin bronze artifacts from that period, they are now able to chemically and spectrographically test the composition of the metals. And they have learned that the copper and the tin come from very disparate sources. Um, 
for instance, uh, some of the copper would come from the Middle East and they found tin coming from Northern Great Britain. Um, so, uh, so that meant there had to be extensive trade networks and such, and it had to be deliberate for those to happen. Uh, arsenic bronze is, as they say again, the natural. This is a 5,000 year old arsenic bronze dagger. Um, they think that humans learned about it by accident about 7,500 years ago. And also it was independently discovered in South America about 4,000 years ago. Um, and arsenic does normally occur in copper ores. Um, and in archeology span to distinguish it from deliberate uh, more modern copper arsenics, uh, they define it as greater than 1% arsenic in the copper artifact. That's their benchmark to make it a historic arsenic bronze. Um, so campfires, they're about 400 degrees too cool to smelt the ore. Um, but they believe, again, this is where the pottery kilns come in. And it is still debated among historians and archaeologists if humans actually intentionally added arsenic. Um, they have identified some possible methods that early peoples could have done it and how they could have done it. However, there is no hard evidence in the archaeological records to support that they actually did it. But we, they, do, they have figured out that there are possible means that they could have done it using the technology given at the time. Um, most bronzes are tins bronzes. Uh, there's classic bronze, which uh, has a lower copper content to tin and mild bronze, which is higher. Also other trace metals and minerals can be in it. Um, and they think that uh, they learned to make this through natural alloys. Um, and remember I said, tin is usually not found near copper, uh, but it was hard enough for plows, tools and weapons. And weapons are not just defensive weapons. They could also be used for uh, hunting and such like that. So when we talk about weapons, it's, it would be anything like that, not just to you know, wage war or any or defensive or offensive weapons, but also hunting weapons. Uh, it had an excellent strength and ductility to it, which made it easy workable, and they could start specializing tools. Um, and actually, bronze was harder than iron, uh, than the early wrought irons, which is why when, when people learned to smell iron, it didn't overtake the Bronze Age for quite a while. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, basically, iron came in when the tin trade uh, with uh, various peoples uh, blocking the routes of tin, and that it caused the Bronze Age to collapse and such like that. And so iron would take over about that time. By that time, too, steel had also been uh, developed. Brass is the other one. There's two main types of brass, red brass and yellow brass. Uh, these are two examples of them, so you can kind of see uh, the different colors. Uh, they're also known as yellow copper. Um, likely discovered again as a natural alloy. Uh, prize for its durability, corrosion resistance, and gold like color. Um, brass actually has antimicrobial properties to it, which is why it's used in plumbing fixtures um, and such. Also, cabinet knobs and low friction bearings. It's used for musical instruments and jewelry today. Um, again, the difficulty in making it is why we have no brass age. Uh, known about 5,000 years ago, um, by the Roman times, 2,500 years ago, the Romans were deliberately alloying it. Um, there is a process rather complicated. It's kind of simplified here because copper and zinc cannot melt together. And that's what brass is, copper and zinc. Um, they cannot melt together. So they were made by a cementation process. And because zinc vaporizes well below the melting temperature of copper. So zinc goes to a gas before copper becomes a liquid, which is one of the main problems in forming historic brass. Um, so zinc occurs as a composite ore, and it's one of the ones that's not a native ore. So even though humans were using zinc, and we now recognize zinc as a metal, remember, it's not on that list because they did not identify zinc as a metal at the time and didn't use it as a metal. Um, so they had to produce this zinc oxide by roasting it, turning it into uh, zinc carbonate ore or calamine as they called it. And then combining under heat, the copper would absorb the zinc vapors, lowering the melting temperature until it formed the brass. That's basically how they did it. 
And I tried to find an old brass artifact. The best I could come up with was the Antikytheria mechanism, which is a little over 2,000 years old. The modern process of making brass is a bit different than the historic. Uh, the other alloy of copper that was known in, in uh, prehistoric times was cooper nickel. This is an alloy of copper and nickel, uh, sometimes with iron or manganese in it to strengthen it. Um, also known as white copper due to its silvery color. Uh, it was known 2,300 years ago in China. It was there found as a natural alloy. There's no evidence of deliberate alloying as nickel was not known as a metal in the ancient world. So uh, they think it was just simply working natural alloys. Um, some of the uh, Greco-Bactrian coins uh, from that period there about 2180 to 2170 years ago uh, by analyzing the chemical composition of the metal, they believe that the uh, cooper nickel actually came from China. Because they can tell because ores occur with different compositions of materials around the world, and they can tell looking at that signature. Uh, the metal was actually at some point around 2000 years ago lost to history in the Western world and was only later on rediscovered in Europe centuries later. Uh, today, cooper nickel is most often used in marine environments because it has excellent corrosion resistance in saltwater environments. Um, the next one we'll talk about is tin because of its association with bronze. Um, they never really used tin as a metal in and of itself. Uh, tin was used as a constituent of tin bronze. Uh, the oldest mining of it comes uh, from well and deep into continental Europe about 6,500 years ago. Uh, the shipwreck off of Israel, though, about 4,200 to 3,200 years ago, has tin that they were able now recently to trace to Cornwall in England. This is very hard evidence of early trade links and such. And uh, the reason is tin and copper ores are rare to find together, so you have to find them at different places and bring them to a central location. Out of tin, the only other useful alloy of the time was pewter. Um, that's a uh, alloy of tin, lead, and copper. Um, tin is the leading constituent in it. Um, dates to the early Bronze Age. Uh, and some historians believe it may be the second oldest deliberate alloy uh, that humans learned how to make. Oldest artifacts just under 3,500 years old found in Egypt. I'm not sure if that picture is of it or not. I couldn't really find it, although some seem to indicate so. At least it's a representative of a pewter item from that rough time period. Um, now, modern pewter is lead free if it's used for items in contact with humans, because of course, lead is known to be toxic to humans. So if you buy something today that like say a pewter mug or something like that, it would be lead free pewter, but historically, Pewter did contain lead. Um, lead, of course, um, is one of the early ones. And uh, it's neat here, plumum, it's where we get a word plumbing. And the person who works with it, plumber, comes from the Latin word for lead. Um, it's the second metal that was identified as by humans. It comes before the discovery of bronze by about a thousand years. Uh, the oldest lead artifact. Lead containing artifact is a statue found in Turkey. Um, this is the to the right is a picture of the oldest smelted lead artifact uh, from a cave in Israel about 6,000 years old. Uh, this puts it in the late copper age. Uh, it's possibly a spindle wall for weaving is what they think it is for weaving and spinning of fabrics. They think it's a spindle wall. Um, by 4,000 years ago, they started to realize how toxic uh, lead was. Uh, however, it was soft, uh, stable, ductile, and malleable, and found useful for vessels and later in pipes in Roman times. So it was used for plumbing back in the Roman era. Uh, one of the things out of it is metallic antimony. Uh, now, antimony is a element on the periodic chart number 51. That is straight antimony. Metallic antimony is considered to be an alloy of lead in tin, uh, not the prime metal. So, uh, um, so when it's uh, alloyed, uh, be, it's referred to as metallic antimony. Uh, it's mostly found as stibnite, as the sulfide of antimony. 
Uh, it's not considered to be a true metal. It's considered to be a metalloid. And, um, but um, it was identified about 5,000 years ago in Egypt, but they didn't use it as a metal. They used it as a cosmetic and they used it for vessels in Chaldea. Um, there they did do some things, but uh, also they used it for paint like on Egyptian statues. Uh, however, historically, um, antimony is most misidentified as lead because it has a similar appearance. So it was not identified as antimony in the prehistoric times. Um, so it was used as an alloying agent with metals, uh, and most of it appears antimonial copper, again, this, this copper uh, uh, alloy. It added hardness to the copper. Um, and as I said, also as a cosmetic, and I found this too, the most famous user of antimony as a cosmetic was Jezebel of the Bible. Uh, it's because it was used as a mascara. Okay, it's considered highly toxic for human use, so it's no longer used in cosmetics. Uh, gold, um, its presence is found in caves, I said 42,000 years ago. And by the way, on the right, I, I forgot to, uh, I missed putting that picture up later on, but if you took all the world, it's ever, all the gold that's ever been uh, excavated in the world and put it in one solid block, that's about how much of the Washington Monument it would fill. So it tells you that how little gold actually is in the world. Um, as I said, it was found as flakes, but not worked into objects until the Copper Age. Uh, refinement of tools allowed the delicate working of it into objects of art and beauty uh, during the early uh, Bronze Age and Copper Age. The oldest gold artifact is a bead from 6,600 years ago. Uh, by 6,000 years ago, there's evidence of gold smelting. Um, about 2,500 years ago, it was used as coinage. Um, and Gold can be hammered to one atom in thickness. Never see gold leaf. It's one atom in thickness. I have used gold leaf uh, with a little bit of the embassy project with we were doing some gold leafing. And it's actually semi-transparent. It's kind of has like a green issue to it, but you can actually see through it at that one atom in thickness. Um, it was also used for exportation in South and Mesoamerica. However, North America, in addition, is peoples consider gold useless. There are no real gold artifacts found in North America. So they didn't use it even for ornamentation. As I said, uh, trivia would fill the bottom third of the Washington Monument if you put all the gold ever mined in the world together. Um, one of the chief alloys of gold, there are many, I just chose to this one, because most of the gold alloys are used for jewelry in more modern terms like uh, white gold and uh, stuff like that. So I, I concentrated here on electron. Uh, it was first used for coinage. Um, sometimes has traces of copper and platinum in it, uh, but it can be anywhere from about 45 to 90% gold. Um, on the right top there is some electron wires from Colorado, the Telluride mine in Colorado. It's known as white gold or pale gold because it was silvery in color. Um, it's mentioned in Egypt 4,500 years ago or so. Uh, used for coins, and it was considered to be better than gold because it was harder and more durable. It didn't wear out as quickly, uh, so it was preferred for coins. Silver is another one that, um, an early one of the precious metals. First worked about 6,000 years ago from nuggets. They found it malleable and ductile. Um, that value is a precious metal, although not as valuable as a gold because it does tarnish, uh, unlike gold. Uh, however, neither gold nor silver led to any growth of metallurgy because of the very limited usefulness of the metals at the early stage. Uh, and it was too soft for practical use for most things. Um, but it was used for ornamentation. And then you have a primitive form of money called hack silver, where they would literally hack or cut pieces apart to break them down and weigh them for transactional value. Um, I also mentioned too sterling silver, which doesn't come in until the modern era. Uh, most things today because it's a harder, more durable silver than straight silver itself. But sterling silver was not known in the prehistoric world. Uh, this one surprises a lot of people. They did, you know, think of mercury, they don't think of it back in prehistoric times. But uh, yes, it was identified. Uh, it kind of, uh, most commonly came from cinnabar, it's ore, main ore. Um, but it was historically known as quicksilver. Um, 
Sulfide was also a red pigment that was used for cave arc. Uh, this, in this case, red vermilion instead of red ochre. Known to the Chinese and Hindus before 4,000 years ago, uh, there is a tomb over in China that supposedly, according to legends, has rivers and lakes of mercury in it. And although the Chinese have never allowed penetration of the tomb, studies of the soil around it show a very high mercury composite to the area. Uh, found in Egyptian tombs from 3,500 years ago, it used to make amalgams. Uh, amalgam is um, the alloys of mercury. They're known as amalgams. Uh, for instance, the amalgam is used to dissolve metals such as gold and silver, but uh, and uh, used it for ointments too in cosmetics. Uh, mercury very early on. Uh, found in um, almost 2,000 years ago in uh, Tuachcocan in Mexico in a pyramid. And it's the only metal actually to share a name with a planet. And most people today think of, think of amalgam, they think of dental amalgam used for dental restoration and such. Um, so we come to iron, and uh, this is the most important of the ancient metals. And of course, it's so important that we call it the Iron Age, and it becomes the most useful of them. Um, iron production actually started in the Bronze Age, but as I said, it didn't supplant bronze because it was softer and less useful initially. Um, however, um, it was discovered about 3,000 years ago um, and uh, when it was finally came the dominant metal was at the collapse of the Bronze Age culture uh, due to the disruption of the tin, tin trade. Um, the end of the Iron Age is kind of considered at the end of the uh, a period where the historical records begin, where you actually have languages to record things, which is about 2,500 years ago in the Western world. And of course, again, occurs at different times at different locations. And steel emerges about 800 years before the Iron Age actually begins. So that's why we say steel is an ancient form of the metal. So there are three basic alloys of iron that are used in society. The oldest is wrought iron. Uh, it's a low carbon iron with about 2% slag as fibrous inclusions. Uh, it's made by repeated hammering and heating. Today it's considered to be an obsolete form. It's been replaced by mild steel for most uses. Today, if you go and buy some, let's say patio furniture, something that's, that's uh, they say it's made out of wrought iron. It actually is not made out of wrought iron. It'd be made out of mild steel or perhaps even cast iron. Uh, so today, wrought iron has become more of a descriptive term for kind of a look, but true wrought iron is an actual alloy of iron. Steel is low carbon from about two thousandths of percent to about 1.5 with little to no silicon, and that's the fiber slags, inclusions, uh, depending on the grade. The higher grades will have less in it than the lower grades. And steel is converted from pig iron or from historically from wrought iron. Other metals and minerals can be added for specific types. So today we have four main categories of types of steel, carbon steel, alloy steel, tool steel, and stainless steel. All of the nearly thousand different steel alloys fall into one of those four, four categories. The third one is cast iron, which is an iron or over 2.1% up to about 4%, uh, but still has some silicon and other metals in it, but not in fibrous inclusions in the case of cast iron it's in uh, little uh, globular type of things it like kind of looks like a block of styrofoam uh, and it could be also flat depending on the type of iron made so it's a little bit more of a granular structure than the fibrous inclusions uh, cast iron is made from pig iron which is the product of a blast furnace and cast iron because of its high carbon content has a lower melting point than either wrought iron or steel the first examples of iron are about 5,200 years ago. This is cold working of meteoric iron and telluric iron. Um, iron is also a common impurity in copper ores. And most historians believe that iron was first discovered during uh, bronze or copper smelting, that they would find this uh, shiny silvery metallic substance in the furnaces after taking the copper out. And of course, being curious, working it, thinking that uh, they might have uh, figured out that it was a new type of metal. 
Um, the oldest examples of true smelted iron are about 4,500 years ago, and this is attributed to the Hittites. Uh, the early time was made in a blooming process by repeatedly heating and hammering to force out the slag and concentrate the iron. This is not held enough to melt it, but makes it a spongy mass. And the bloomery process got its name. Uh, bloom comes from the Latin word meaning flower. And when you looked into the furnace, when the, uh, the, uh, the ore and the soft the slags would come out of it, it kind of looked like a bowl of flowers blooming, which is how it got its name, the bloomery process. And it was used to produce wrought iron. Uncertain where it actually first occurred because it's very difficult to distinguish cold and hot work meteoric iron. Because when they started learning how to hot work it, they also hot work meteoric iron. And because there's no real chemical change, that's very hard. But um, the Iron Age is now said to start when the widespread adoption of this iron actually does replace bronze. And um, in this, you know, we have the early steel at about 3,800 years ago. Uh, meteoric iron, uh, relatively easy to find in the arid environment of the Middle East. Uh, this is a piece of meteorite on the ground in the Sahara Desert. Uh, they uh, recognized it because they could see these uh, meteorites coming through the sky, and then they would find this black rock near where they seemed to come to the earth. So that's why they gave it those names, black copper for heaven and such like that. Used well before the advent of iron smelting. Uh, Iron is both malleable and ductile, soft enough to be worked cold with a hammer. Yes, you can work wrought iron. You can't work uh, steel or cast iron with a hammer, but you can work wrought iron or meteoric iron. Um, as I said, taste of the Middle Bronze Age and uh, made into tools, weapons, and other cultural items. And there was a time when iron and steel were worth their weight in gold, by the way. Uh, meteoric iron. Uh, it's the only significant naturally occurring native iron. Uh, iron normally does not occur in its native state on the earth. It readily oxidizes. So this was an iron nickel uh, comp composition, uh, the Winmish Staten. You can see the cross hatching. This is uh, a piece of a uh, nickel, iron nickel meteorite. You can see that pattern in it. And this is what they used in those early days. Uh, it's the only significant form of native iron that is not an ore. Um, so uh, they, did not, they do not consider meteoric iron an ore. Um, in order to distinguish it, um, because you can add nickel to iron today, uh, generally it's a, um, ores and such that has it naturally in it never exceeds 4%. And uh, so when they worked uh, nickel bearing iron ores, they can distinguish them from meteorite, which always have at least 5% nickel content. That's the benchmark they use. Uh, here's some examples. Um, this is a, uh, a dagger from King Tut's tomb. Um, it's the oldest known meteoric iron objects. Uh, they also found a uh, iron bead uh, about 3,200 years ago or 5,200 years ago and some other ones, uh, different ones. But this is about uh, 30, 1,300 years ago, or excuse me, 3,300 years ago, this iron dagger from uh, uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. And it's 11% nickel and actually has a little bit of cobalt in it. So um, very early uh, iron working and such. Telluric iron is uh, a metallic form that originates on the earth. It's not meteoric. Uh, it's a native form of iron rather than nor it's the only other type of iron on the earth that is not an ore. Um, however, it is a very extremely rare. It's only found in a couple small deposits. Uh, Castle Germany is one. Um, Greenland is another place, and a couple other very, very minor deposits. So it never was really worked in any great quantity. And the number of telluric iron uh, found is less than the number of meteoric iron pieces. So that tells you how rare it is. It also is an iron nickel ore. However, it only has 3% nickel content. That's how they were able to distinguish it from meteoric iron. And um, the Inuit people were the only humans known to utilize it in a practical way. Most people didn't even bother with it because it wasn't in sufficient quantity. Uh, rot irons, um, rot means to work. These are semi-fused masses. This is what come out of the bloomery. Uh, 
slag in the iron, remember there's fibrous uh, siliceous strands that gives it a distinctive grain. It's historically the most common form of malleable iron. Um, and uh, was made in the broomery process by heating it and hammering it to uh, and heat it to just below melting temperature. They couldn't quite get it up to melting temperature, but they would uh, repeatedly heat it and hammer it in order to form it into iron. And the result was a bloom. From there, then the bloom was further worked to it became wrought iron. Now, these are some examples. The top one is an artifact made of wrought iron from a long time ago, um, from the Iron Age. Uh, the bottom left here, you see, this is a corroded piece of wrought iron. Do you see how the strands follow the bending of it? That's when it's heated to work it. Those strands form it and give the iron grain. That gives it some tensile strength. Uh, also, if you take a rod and fracture it like this, that's, how, that's the easy way to tell how it is um, a uh, wrought iron because it has those strands. It kind of breaks like tree limbs in that fiber structure. Steel. Um, as one uh, historian said, it was a mystical metal to be marveled at. Uh, it's today, it's the most common and mundane of materials made. Uh, early examples, I said, are, you know, going back almost 4,000 years, I uh, found it in Atolia. These are cementation process later in bloomeries. Um, there were high carbon steels at that time, up to 2% carbon. And the knife to the right is made out of woot steel. And Woots was used to make Damascus steel. So you've ever heard of Damascus steel? And it's a very high quality steel. And because it's repeatedly hammered and forms laminations, you can see that it has this very beautiful pattern to it. Those are the laminations in the steel. And when it's highly polished, those can be seen. Um, by 2000 years ago in Tanzania, we actually knew about carbon steel. Uh, which most people again think is a modern form of it. Um, and I said, you know, steel was very expensive to make until modern times. Cast iron is the other one um, that could have been produced in copper smelting furnaces by accident. However, the, only the Chinese produced cast iron in the prehistoric era. Uh, and examples there date over 2,500 years ago. In the Western world, in Europe, they did not produce cast iron until the early 1400s. Uh, they found out, for some reason, they either didn't run across it or didn't find it useful until, um, you know, a little over 600 years ago. So blast furnaces like Greenwood are actually fairly recent in the modern world, um, in the Western world, but in China, they were in the prehistoric era. And by the way, uh, they also discovered Bessemer steel in China 1500 years before Henry Bessemer was born. So uh, the ancient Chinese were very uh, good in figuring out uh, making different alloys of iron. Uh, but the society did not really uh, allow for the diffusion of technology, so they kind of stayed localized. So that moves us into the historic era, uh, where small advancements would take place over the succeeding centuries People learned about the new properties of these as they worked them, new metals and new alloys would be identified, but it would be some time until the eighth metal was in fact identified. So I got one bonus question for you. Through all these metals and others uh, in this list were known in ancient times, this mineral was not identified as a metal until the 13th century, about 700 years ago, becoming the eighth metal. So go back in the chat, what do you think it is? The eighth metal. We have a vote for zinc, two votes for zinc, three. Anybody else? It looks like the consensus is zinc. Yeah, it looks like I stumped them on this one. The answer is arsenic. <laughs> um, yeah, arsenic is the eighth metal to be added to that list of the seven metals. All the other ones came later on, even though, and what's interesting is aluminum or aluminum, as it was called then, was known in the prehistoric world, but really was not used as a metal, but they did find it 
uh, and played around a little bit with it, but never really made it. But the other ones were all, all metals that were known, but not identified as metals in the prehistoric world. Um, so anyway, this brings us to uh, the Industrial Revolution, where the seven metals would remain relevant even into our modern era. As that began in the early 1700s, uh, we found new uses for it. Of course, we have the four pillars of that. Uh, if you want to know uh, this, the four pillars of the Industrial Revolution, mechanization of the manufactured textiles, advancement in iron production, leading to mass manufacturing of steel, precision machining and standardizing of parts, and utilization of a new source of power. You know, I realized to about 200 years ago, we only had wind, water, and muscle as sources of power. Uh, the fourth one was steam. So think about how useful these metals are in our modern world and how they still find relevance today. And if it weren't for the discovery and use of all metals, we would still be in the Stone Age. And one above all is still the most useful of all the metals, that's iron in the form of steel. So uh, any questions? You can turn your uh, mics on now if you want to, to ask questions. Any questions? I guess not. I must have covered it all. <laughs> a lot of research into that program, I guarantee you that. Yeah, and it's still a little bit in the rough. I don't have all the animations hey, for what I was, I was would, really would working on right up to the last minute. Can you email me a copy of the program? Uh, it'll be available on Jerry's site. Even, even the uh, slideshow? Well, the PowerPoint is way too big to email, uh, size-wise. It's it's uh, about between three and four hundred megabytes in size. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick it up from uh, Jerry's site. You can Thank see, you. You can see the video, yeah. Yeah, you can watch the video of it. A lot of research there for sure.